Before we get into this week's episode, we have a very special announcement from our sponsors, our very own Dungeons of Drakenheim. If you haven't heard of Dungeons of Drakenheim, it probably means you're brand new to our channel because we have been talking about it for a while. Dungeons of Drakenheim is a campaign module designed by Monty and myself to take characters from level 1 to 13 through the dark, ruined fantasy city of Drakenheim, which is based on the live play campaign that we have been running for the last few years. If you are looking for a campaign that merges faction intrigue, player-driven stories, cosmic horror, all set against the backdrop of urban fantasy, this might be the perfect campaign for you. We have already delivered the full and final PDF to all of our backers at the end of 2021 after coming off the backs of our very successful Kickstarter campaign. And we are so excited to announce that in this month, we are going to be making Dungeons of Drakenheim available for everyone through the Ghostfire Gaming Store, which you can find in the links below. Our backers are already sharing incredible stories about the Dungeons of Drakenheim campaigns that they are running. So if you back the Kickstarter, make sure that you've downloaded your copy of the PDF. And if you aren't a backer, make sure to grab your pre-order by following the links below. And now, on to this week's episode. Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Welcome to our channel where we cover everything D&D, including advice for players and guides for game masters. We upload new videos on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Today, we are breaking down the strongest subclasses for all 13 classes in D&D 5e. This is a bit of a retrospective look back at the tier ranking videos that we have done over the past two years <laughs> yeah so we've we spent a lot of time going over all of the subclasses in the game and ranking them as best we can but now that we've wrapped that up it's time to look back and we've been able to try more subclasses out analyze them further get results and feedback from the community and we opened a new poll for our community to see what everybody thought the strongest subclasses are so what we're going to do today is take a look at the community's views and Monty and I are going to have a chat about our own views, whether we agree with the community, whether some of our opinions on these subclasses have changed, and whether there's some good candidates for the best subclasses for each class in Dungeons and Dragons. Now, of course, we acknowledge right off the bat that the strongest subclass for each class is very, very subjective at the end of the day, and every table runs D&D a little bit differently and that can change the results depending on the campaigns and depending on everything. This is not a call to always play these subclasses at all. There is a lot of great role-playing opportunities in every class. There's a lot of really great mechanical distinctions in all the subclasses acro across them. This is just a fun thought experiment to ask that big question, which is the strongest? And maybe in the process of doing so, we might reveal which classes are better internally balanced. Because in some cases, the community poll results were really, really heavily weighted. And in others, there was a more split opinion. We believe that a well-designed class should be pretty split amongst the community, where elements of the way you play the character or the uh, feats that you choose, the various choices that you make along the way, can really bring every subclass of a class to life. In some cases, that hasn't been the case, and in some, it is. So in this look, we're going to kind of nitpick the imbalance in some of the classes but also we have heard when discussing this video with our community what about role playing what about these other subclasses that can really be brought to life and i think that's a valid argument so while monty and i are sharing our opinions and looking at the opinions of the community never be afraid to play the character that you want to play i think that's the most important part but let's have some fun and dissect all the classes in D&D and talk about some power gaming. So let's kick things off with the Artificer, the newest class introduced to the game. There's only four subclasses here. What did our community say? Well, 40.5% of our community thought the Armorer was the strongest subclass, but there's a pretty close race as the Battlesmith is following shortly behind at 32.5%. The next topic category we threw in not sure and actually 16% of people were not sure which was the strongest 
only 9.8% of respondents gave it to the artillerist, with a tiny sliver, 1% of respondents giving it to the alchemist. Now, when we analyze this, I actually think that that I am in agreement with the community on this. And I think the not sure category is people who couldn't make up their minds between the armorer and the battlesmith. Having recently played a battlesmith and doing our battlesmith video that we mm -hmm. did, it became apparent that the battlesmith was actually much better than I think we gave it credit for yes. initially. Yes. The battlesmith, we both came up with really impressive builds that were vastly different, which showed the versatility of the artificer to me. I do think that the armorer perhaps makes the better tank and can really deliver some really cool options on the battlefield for absorbing damage, which I think gives it that nudge ahead. I think the armor, you just end up getting so many more infusions put on your own gear that that really, really makes it pull ahead. And I, I do think the armor is more straightforward to build um, because I think that one of the things that we noticed when we were building Battlesmiths was that there's a lot of different directions that you can take them. And one of the things that I really noticed in some of our recent games with the Battlesmith is the Steel Defender is good, but not that good. <laughs> Yeah, at high level yeah. play, if it gets targeted, you lose out on a lot of what your class has to offer. Yeah, it really really cuts you back. Yeah, when the Steel Defender is out of position, or when it gets destroyed, it really, really harms the effectiveness of the Battlesmith. But overall, I think the community's onto something here, and I fully agree with their rankings. Yeah. And I think that that means that we have two substantially good options. And not to say that the Artillerist is not a good option. I think it's clear from this graph that there's one dud amongst the Artificer options. When we move on to the Barbarian, this one has a very clear winner. We have 63.6% giving it to Totem Warrior, with 16.8% going to the Zealot. The other significant slice of the pie does go to the Ancestral Guardian with 7.2%. All the other subclasses really just being a tiny sliver uh, of, of the pie, uh, most of which not even beating out the not sure option. <laughs> Now what's interesting here is when Monty and I were having our discussion, we were at a toss up between the Zealot or the Totem Warrior. But what I think ends up coming out here is although the Zealot might be the best barbarian for dealing damage, a Totem Warrior barbarian is nearly impossible to kill. <laughs> yeah. And we've yeah. actually both seen this in our own yep. games, trying our hardest to kill a Totem Warrior who picks the bear totem. It's insane. It really can't be stressed enough how powerful of a build the Bear Totem Barbarian is. Yeah, now the Zealot can be killed, but they will come back. And they do a little bit more damage, but they also don't get the kind of out-of-combat utility that you do get a smidgen of with the Totem uh, Barbarian. So even beyond the Bear Totem, I think that just if we're looking at a well-rounded character that is the strongest overall we've got great combat applications but then we also have stuff that we can utilize outside of combat as well and this is one of the only barbarian subclasses that even gives us any of that so i think that really pulls it up to the top this is an overwhelming majority in this case uh for the uh the totem warrior barbarian and i would say probably a lot of the other barbarian subclasses need a little bit more as we move on to the Bards, this one is almost too close to call. There are two subclasses that stand up above all the rest, and that is the College of Eloquence and the College of Lore. This is almost a split vote, with the College of Lore getting 39.8% of the vote, and the College of Eloquence getting 39.5% of the vote. None of the other Bard subclasses received more than 3% of the votes. So this actually is both a surprise and not a surprise to me. I thought that Eloquence was going to be the clear winner. I thought this was going to look like the Barbarian for yes. Eloquence. Yeah. Now, with the Lore Bard, I think you get your extra magical secrets and your skill versatility, and I do think that that does add a lot to the Bard. So, although I thought that Eloquence was best and Lore would be the obvious second, it's pretty much neck and neck, and I'm willing to say that that's not too far off what I had imagined. 
I think we said when we were tier ranking, the College of Eloquence is like, yes, I would like another scoop of Bard, please. Whereas the College of Lore now in comparison looks like it is giving you a little bit more diversity and a little bit more versatility overall. I still find myself often torn when I'm considering making a bar between these two subclasses. And so I think that it's actually a good thing <laughs> that it is neck and neck like this. Overall, one of the things that I will say looking back is we were pretty harsh in our tier ranking on the other bard subclasses, particularly the Whispers and the Swords Bard. And I want to say that the Bard is probably one of the strongest classes in the game. So even though the Swords and Whispers Bards aren't as strong in an absolute comparison between the top and bottom, the bard, you're, you're a strong character by merit of being a bard alone. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's something that we never actually stressed enough in the video is I still put all of the lowest ranked bards above so many of the other classes. I would play a Whispers bard in a heartbeat. If somebody was like, you get to play a Way of Four Elements monk or a Whispers bard, <laughs> yeah. like yeah. I'm, they're, those aren't in the same category yeah they're 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 not in the same social circle at all no the no. the whispers bard is going to beat the crap out of the four yeah. elements monk and not that they're fighting but i love bards and i think that playing a bard in general pick the one that is going to speak to your play style the most that you are going to have the most fun with are the eloquence and lore clearly standing up as winners here yes but that's not to say that people out there who are saying, but I really wanted to play a Swords Bard, you're going to have a great time. Honestly, I just think the only thing that would fix the Swords Bard and the Whispers Bard for me is that if their iconic abilities were used a number of times equal to their proficiency modifier, rather than drawing from the same pool as Bardic Inspiration. Because we love using Bardic Inspiration yeah. for yeah. Bardic Inspiration, but I love the Bard. Coming around to the Cleric, we have another landslide. The Cleric was once a very diverse field, <laughs> with lots of varying beliefs and traditions, all flourishing and working together in harmony. And then Twilight descended on the land, and now the dark times have begun, and the Twilight Cleric got 62.8% of the votes. And peace is a distant memory at only 11.5% of the votes. <laughs> Again, this doesn't surprise me, although I did think Peace Cleric was going to get a slightly larger chunk. This was another one where I thought it was going to look more like, like, I thought it was going to look more like the Bard, right? I thought there's gonna, it's going to be a total split between Peace and Twilight. But we all know the opinion of the Twilight Cleric by a lot of the community. Uh, this is, in many people's arguments, the most powerful subclass in the game. I'm still really keen to play one. I personally think that the Twilight Domain Cleric sounds like a lot of fun and there is a way to play a great support character who helps the whole team. Yep. Does it possibly cause problems for DMs? That's where we get into the issue with the Twilight Cleric. I think newer DMs who have a player play a Twilight Domain Cleric and they're not ready for it. That's the imbalance here. Mm. But I, I still think that the Twilight Domain Cleric is such a fun and cool subclass. I'm not banning it at my table, but when I hear people banning it, I'm not shaking my fist at them either. I don't know if the Twilight Cleric is this much better than the other clerics. I think that the per it's clearly the winner, but it's like it's it's kind of like in a pool of Olympic athletes. Yes, there's always going to be the Michael Phelps and the Usain Bolt. But the other athletes are really amazing too. Yes, but in this poll, we are asking the audience to pick their their what they think the strongest one is. So it does make sense that majority of people picked it. Yeah. But when you look at this pie chart, don't think that the Twilight Domain Cleric is sixty two point eight percent better than all the other clerics. Like the Bard, any cleric you play yeah. is awesome. Yeah. So yeah. following in the twilight of the cleric, as we move to the druid, the moon rises and we have another really distinct winner here. It's not even a comparison that the uh, the circle of the moon gets 
0.4%. With the shepherd pulling in their flock at only 11%. Much like the cleric, this is almost a similar breakdown, where again, it makes sense. Everybody knows the power of the moon druid. What I will say, though, is that, again, if you look at this pie chart, not as the moon druid being this much better, but I actually do think that 11% choosing shepherd states the obvious that the shepherd druid is extremely potent and our recent game proved that i want to also note that 10.4 percent gave it to the circle of stars so the stars the moon the twilight oh we really are in the darkest timeline but there's a glimmer of light there's a glimmer of light there's a, is that glimmer of light twilight dim light is it filling the area with dim light there will be no more bright light in this area no. Back to some normalcy here. When we move on to the fighter, we get a pretty nice split. Now, Battlemaster does pull ahead with 43.2%, but the Echo Knight is a very close second. 35%. Give it to the Echo Knight. And a significant sliver, 7%, uh, about giving it to the Eldritch Knight. Um, I think the Battlemaster remains the crowd favorite. Um, the Echo Knight is really, really potent. And I just have to say that I think the Echo Knight is strong because it's poorly written. <laughs> and there's so much ambiguity over how the ability actually works. And I think that if the Explorer's Guide to Wild Mount had have come out after Tasha's, I think the Echo would have been written in the same way that like things like the Drake Warden's Drake Companion or the new Beastmaster or anything that gets one of the companions are, are set up because it's just so ambiguous. Um, I'm glad, though, that... The classic Battlemaster fighter is still holding their ground. Now, I do think that there are plenty of other great fighter options out there. I think there's a great case here for the Rune Knight, which gets 10.5%, and shouldn't be doubted that a Rune Knight is a really great choice for a fighter as well. In many ways, the Battlemaster is the definitive fight fighter archetype, and I do wonder if more of the, the Battlemaster might bleed into the other fighter subclasses in the future. What's interesting as we move on to the Monk is that we said a well-designed class would be more evenly split. But I actually think in the case of the Monk, we're looking at the inverse of that, where it's very evenly split because it's one of the weaker design classes and nobody really knows what the best option is. It actually still is kind of obvious here that the Way of Mercy is the winner with 35.5%. Whereas all of the other relatively decent options are pretty comparable, landing around the 15 to 16% mark. Those being the way of shadow and the way of the open hand, with the other 15% being not sure. The Kensai and the Astral Self did get 5% chunks. Everything else, though, is pretty predictable. I think that Way of the Mercy is, in my opinion, one of the only monk subclasses that showcases what we would like to see from more monk subclasses. There are some really cool options here if you enjoy playing a monk, and there's a lot of fun to be had with some of these options, but there's also, I think, more duds in this class than in a lot of other ones. It really seems like Wizards of the Coast is afraid to give monks a really good subclass or any really good subclasses to, to begin with. And I do think that, that probably the base class does need some love. Um, I kind of, my, my gut tells me that if we were gonna go back in and really you know redesign the monk from the ground up, I think we would probably start with limiting stunning strike to once per turn. And I think that that would, if it was once per turn, I think that maybe Wizards of the Coast would be less afraid to give the monk good subclasses, even though being able to stunning strike multiple times has never really been that much of a problem in my games. Um, and then probably counter counteracting that with giving every monk the ability to fly at higher levels and giving monks way more attacks. Um, and probably even let's give them the ability to teleport somewhere in there as well. And, and maybe then we'll start cooking with gas and we can actually get some monks that have some substance to it. Because, like, let, let's not lie, I, I feel like every monk ultimately kind of wants to grab, like, archetypes from martial arts films and anime. And so I don't think it's a problem for every monk to be able to do things like teleport and fly. That would be super cool. And then we can build from that. <laughs> when I think of the monk, I find myself getting increasingly more uh, critical of the monk subclasses coming out. And I might be getting too harsh on them, but that's also because I'm just waiting. I'm waiting so hard for this 
this beautiful monk yeah. subclass that makes me excited to play a monk again. And I, having played a monk through a full campaign, did really enjoy it. There are great moments where I got to throw bolts from a ballista back at a group. I got to stunning strike a dragon out of the sky. There were great, beautiful moments that I had as a monk. I just wish that there was more options for subclasses that excited me because really I'm picking between two or three. Yeah, I, I think it's easy to have a good time with a monk with, with your typical group of D&D &D players, but there can be elements where like you see the monk put amongst other really strong characters and it just gets disappointing to see. When we move on to the Paladin, this one is pretty cut and dry. We get 62.5% for the Oath of Vengeance, with a second place going to the Oath of Conquest with 12%. Very aggressive Paladins. Paladins are not nice anymore. Paladins want to conquer and get vengeance. Yes, the angry Paladins <laughs> yeah. are the best Paladins. This is the darkest timeline. <laughs> I think that this is very much expected from the Paladin. I think that, again, Paladin is one of those subclasses that I put as well with the cleric and the bard. One of those classes that pretty much any paladin you play is going to be a great character on the table. Yeah. But it's clear that vengeance and conquest are the coolest option. I agree. I think the most transformative element of most paladin subclasses is actually the spell list. The paladin abilities tend to be middling and then it's just, I think, really the fact that, like, the Oath of Qu Conquest and Vengeance both have such amazing spell lists, and they have a really good Channel Divinity, too. And I think, actually, the other case is, is that Channel Divinity. Yeah. I think that it's clear that Conquest and Vengeance have the most usable yeah. Channel Divinity options, the most immediately applicable, obvious to use, and powerful to use. So I think that that just dials them up and makes them the most obvious choices here. The doom and gloom continues as we move to the ranger, where 74.5% picked the gloom stalker as the strongest subclass, with the drake warden, though, coming in second with only 8.1%. I, I, again, this is extremely appropriate. I think that the Gloomstalker Ranger is one of the, it, it's not only, in my opinion, the most powerful Ranger subclass, but it is one of the cooler subclasses in the game yeah. and extremely powerful. I, it, it made both of our strongest party lists, or at least was a contender. Yeah, I, you know, we talked about this uh, a little while ago. We had a fun conversation about this um, after one of our collaboration games with Colby and Chris from Trait Monk's Temple and uh, D4D and D Deep Dive where we talked about how having a Gloomstalker in your party, especially a sharpshooter crossbow expert Gloomstalker, is sort of transformative in the what it does to the rest of the party because there's something about the Gloomstalker, and I, I think also the Battlemaster fighter that is a ranged combatant really embodies this too, is that a, a very effective ranged damage dealer that can just deliver a ton of damage downtown at the start of a combat encounter really changes how encounter building works in a very profound way. Um, and a Gloomstalker might not be the strongest character in the entire game overall, but you feel it when you have one in your party. <laughs> Absolutely. Having a Gloomstalker on your team is, is essential. Yeah, now the only other thing that I will say is that most people that I see playing a Gloomstalker take between three and five levels of Gloomstalker. I very rarely see people taking Ranger past that at all it is interesting i do think that the gloomstalker has some cool higher level abilities but the way that gloomstalker blends with fighters or uh rogues yeah. is intense and yeah. so you, there's some incredible multi-classing that because of the gloomstalker's third level features that you get right away three levels of ranger to grab the gloomstalker yeah dials up various rogues and fighters it, to 11. I, I, I think this is something that I think that it shares with the paladin subclasses as well. And maybe some of the other ones where this is just a case where you only need to take a couple levels of this class and then multi-class into something else and you get so much from it. These subclasses are so front-loaded and I think that that's a big theme across many of the top-ranked classes is that they get their thing right away. They don't have to grow up into anything and I think that that's a really important sort of methodology to take with future subclasses as they're being designed is that 
players want to experience their most iconic abilities and features right away and build on those rather than have to wait until level 10 or 15 to do the cool thing. I'm going to say that when we move on to the rogue, this ended exactly how I thought it was going to, with 47.4% going to Arcane Trickster, 25% going to Swashbuckler, and 11% going to the Soul Knife. In my opinion, these are the top three rogue subclasses, and I'm glad that they are represented here. I think the Swashbuckler and the Arcane Trickster are both amazing characters. We have characters of both subclasses in our Drakenheim campaigns, um, we've seen a lot of other players in our campaigns play them both. They're a lot of fun. They're excellent. Um, I do think the Arcane Trickster is a little bit stronger. That's fair. But I would note, I do think that with the emergence of feats like Fey Touched, Shadow Touched, Magic Initiate, I think that there is a build for a Swashbuckler that takes those feats that kind of steals from the Arcane Trickster's playbook and might be a stronger overall character. It just depends on when those feats get taken and how they all stack up. And unless you're adamant about playing a swashbuckler who doesn't understand magic. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the Soul Knife is a newcomer here, so we haven't really seen much of it, but we have seen uh, Joe play one yeah. uh, for a one-shot. And the use of the abilities came in so handy. It was extremely good at what it was meant to do. And I'm really happy that it's that it's proven itself yeah. to be a, a good rogue subclass. Yeah, I, I would like to see a bit of a more of a split with more people. Think, like I think the Soul Knife deserves more credit than maybe it got here. Um, but I, I think that the Arcane Trickster just will always have so much versatility because whenever new spells get added to the game, it's like, oh, well, what happens if you play a Arcane Trickster that picks up Silvery Barbs? Or what happens if you play an Arcane Trickster that decides to have Vortex Warp? Interesting things start to happen. And Silvery Barbs is an enchantment spell, so an Arcane Trickster can take Silvery Barbs. When we're moving on to the Sorcerer, there's actually quite a split here. There is a clear front runner, which is the Clockwork Soul at 35.7%. Uh, the Aberrant Mind takes the 23.5%, which isn't that much higher than the Divine Soul at 20.5%. The other ones get much smaller slivers here, and again, even though this is a broader split, I think this feels like the appropriate split. I think it's interesting that the three subclasses that either add more spells or either spells known or spells that you can take to the sorcerer are the three that rise to the top. And I would say go watch our video on adding expanded spell lists for the other sorcerer subclasses because I think that if that happened, the sorcerer might be the, the class where you would just see everyone feeling differently <laughs> about yeah. it, right? It's so close to having that nice parity between it and maybe that actually makes the sorcerer it, the sorcerer's stock might be rising over the wizard overall in this case and i think that if you have build diversity with the sorcerer which i think we're starting to see like a clockwork soul and a divine soul and an aberrant mind are all going to play really really differently they're all going to feel like really different characters and you go back in, you add the expanded spell list for the other sorcerers, they're all going to feel really different. And that is a really good thing, especially if people have a mixed opinion over which one is the strongest as a result. And I, I'm playing a Shadow Sorcerer and have been for a very long time. And I love the abilities. I love the flavor. If And we have tried implementing an yeah. expanded spell list, and it just makes it feel that much better. The option to cast more spells with the Sorcerer really just makes them feel like a complete class. And... Again, going off of what you just said, Shadow Sorcerer is one of my favorites, but if they all had expanded spell lists, I'm open to playing any of them, depending on what flavor I want. Yep. We descend back into the darkness with the Warlock, and I'll give you one guess. A curse lingers over us. The Hexblade's curse. at 63.5% with the Genie perhaps offering us our wishes of respite with only 20% of the votes. Uh, this this feels appropriate again. Yeah. Um, Hexblade is the clear winner, but Genie gave it a run for its money. I honestly think the Hexblade multi-class really does the heavy lifting here. I think that if you are going to play a single class Warlock all the way from 1 to 20, I think you might be picking 
the uh, the the genie, but it's just all the things that happen when Hexblades multi-class with paladins, sorcerers, or bards, or even other classes in general, just are off the chain. I think that the other warlock subclasses could use a bit of a lift. Again, one of the limitations of the warlock that we've talked about is their spellcasting. And although I understand that it's meant to be a different type of spellcaster, I think that if we gave them as many spell slots as they have proficiency bonus, not tying them together. So you can't abuse it with multi-classing. Yeah, so multi-classing yeah. doesn't abuse it, but just let their spell slots increase the same time that their proficiency bonus increases by the same number. Yeah. And I think that that would actually make a lot more people more likely to play a Warlock because having had a few Warlock players, the biggest disappointment for them is they're either Eldritch Blasting or they're running out of spell slots. The Hexblade gave yeah. a different option to be a melee combatant, so your spell slots are less important. I think the Hexblade speaks to the fact that people love the idea of Gishes. People love playing sword and spell. And I think the biggest design mistake of the Warlock was not making the Hexblade's core feature, that ability to use charisma to attack with your weapon, just what the Pact of the Blade did. So we could have all sorts of blade-wielding warlocks regardless of what their patron is. Because I, I do think that the, the Hexblade is kind of the strangest... It's, it's the odd duck, in flavor-wise, compared to the other warlock patrons. And so I think if we detach that and let the Hexblade be something not called Hexblade, we go a lot further. Finally, we come to the Masters of Magic, the Wizard. Um, I was actually quite surprised by this turnout. I wasn't. <laughs> Fair enough. 34.3% gave it to the Chronergy Wizard, with 21% giving it to the Divination Wizard, and 16.9% giving it to the Bladesinger. I actually thought the Bladesinger was going to do better. Um, I did too. In a lot of respects, the Chronergy Wizard is kind of like the Divination Wizard 2.0. And I think that it offers a really strong suite of abilities for that ultimate battlefield controller, especially with some of the new spells that have been added to the game recently. And I think it's pretty clearly stronger than the Diviner at this stage of the game. The Diviner is still really, really strong, but I, I think that it, it doesn't quite have the same oomph that you get out of uh, Chronergy. Um, the Bladesinger is amazing, though. And I, I do have to say, I, I think that there is a lot of cases where the Bladesinger is the character you want in your party over the Chronergy Wizard. I do think that when we look at Wizards as a whole, what's interesting to me is there's, there's clear winners here. But Wizards don't gain that much from their subclass. Except in the case of these three. That's the thing. That's that's what I was about to say is these three are the standout options where the rest of them add flavor and icing to yeah. your to your yeah. cake. Um, and it's a delicious cake no matter what. But these three are are like top tier icing. Yeah, and, and I mean, the things that you can pull off with all of these characters now, with the new spells in the game, with the new feats in the game, things that have been added in Tasha's and, and more recent books, is insane i think that once again the wizard is a case where even the the wizard subclasses that didn't get very many votes or highly ranked through this process you're still gonna be a pretty powerful character no matter what way you slice it it's just that these three are gonna feel head and shoulders over the others as we wrap this all up i want to reiterate again that we're talking about the strongest subclasses but it is a very subjective concept that we're discussing here and so many people have made arguments for several of the other subclasses well if you take these feats if you play it this way it's really powerful and we fully agree yeah we think we've we've made videos one of our favorite videos is play the character you want to play and what we really state in that video is you don't even need to listen to us when it comes to playing your character. You don't need to listen to tallies and charts and lists that tell you, well, this character is better than this character. The game is generally, for the most part, well-balanced. There are a few exceptions, but if you're playing at a table with your friends, 
chances are you're going to have a good time, especially if you find a character that you can bring to life with great role playing, great concepts, great ideas that make it fun for you. And that's the most important part. If you decide that you don't want to play an Oath of Vengeance or an Oath of Conquest paladin because you want to play a righteous paladin who is serving a good deity and isn't after revenge or conquering, you're still going to have a great time. If, if you decide to play one of the weaker wizards or the weaker rangers, you're still going to have a great time. It's, it's really about what you want to play. And really what we're looking at today is kind of tipping the scales to say that some subclasses do stand out mechanically with what they offer, are easier to use, and just generally more well-liked by the public. To add to this, I think that when it comes to looking at the strongest characters in a vacuum, we often don't think too much about how synergies work between players and their characters. Oftentimes, teamwork, players who know how each other think and can work together and think together effectively on the fly and know how to use their abilities together are going to perform better regardless of what their classes are and what regardless of what their characters are. I think the impact of teamwork and using your abilities together is far, far larger than what individual things happen. And I think what we've seen even recently in some of our collaboration games uh, with, with Chris and Colby is that that teamwork factor is huge. And you can build three very powerful characters together in isolation and then have to go through this period of figuring out, okay, how does everybody work together? And when we compare that to our other games where we've worked together for a long time, we have characters that really know how each other work and how each other play together, you see that really develop a lot better. And so, well, certainly having a strong suite of characters can give you an advantage in putting that all together. It's also going to matter to what your dungeon master's style is. And I think one of the, the really cool things uh, to, to look at is that you know if you have a dungeon master that loves using a diverse array of creatures, large monsters, really big environments, and even a, in a combat heavy campaign, but with a dungeon master that just does do a lot of original set piece style battles, I think the assumptions of what makes a character really, really strong really start to change. Um, and so there's so many ways that this definition of what the strongest character is can change. Dungeons and Dragons is a game where people come together and play and either are a group of friends playing together or becoming friends through the great adventures that they have. And in this way, optimization, power gaming, deciding what the most powerful options are is never going to be as rich or potent even as a group of people who really get along together, understand how each other works, including the dungeon master, and create a fulfilling game experience at the table. So when you're sitting down for your session zero, understanding what everybody wants to bring to the table, the fantasies that they want to explore in their character design, and having a DM who understands that and wants to work with the party to bring those fantasies to life is going to be a far richer experience than just deciding what the most powerful build is in isolation. And Dungeons and Dragons is a game where you want to be challenged. So creating a group of player characters with a dungeon master who's going to be able to challenge you and put your characters to the test as they level up and save the world is going to be much more fun. And at the end of the day, that's the point of this game is to have fun. So we hope that you enjoyed this thought experiment where we look at the community and our own thoughts on all of the classes in Dungeons and Dragons, a bit of a retrospective of our rankings of all the subclasses, and at the end of the day we hope that you feel excited to bring the subclass that you love to life at your next game. If you have any thoughts on the way that these rankings went, please let us know in the comments below. The videos that we create on our channel are made possible because we have an amazing community of Patreon supporters that back us up. If you like the work that we do here on YouTube, please consider joining our community and helping us make these more videos possible by following the links in the description below. And don't forget to check out our live play in the worlds of Drakenheim, which airs Tuesday nights at 6 p.m. Eastern on Twitch. You can find all the previous episodes right up over here. And if you haven't watched them all yet, check out our tier rankings for all the subclasses in D&D 5e right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time in, in the, the dungeon. dungeon.